So good morning, everybody, and welcome to this virtual event on socioeconomic determinants of coronavirus in the UK. My name is Jane Leakes, and I manage the Newton Gateway to Mathematics, which I'm sure, as you all know, is the impact initiative of the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences. So the Newton Gateway has been supporting the RAMP Continuity Network, so that's the Rapid Assistance in Modelling the Pandemic, which is a UKRI-funded project, and uh, the Mostly we've been supporting to help deliver a series of meetings and workshops and virtual study groups that react to key priority areas in the UK's response to the current pandemic. So we've been working with partners and in particular that Juniper um, consortium um, and sort of guided by links to them, um, including people like uh, Kira Dangerfield and uh, Julia Gold. Um, and uh, we're very grateful to our academic organiser Dr. Alison Hale of the University of Lancaster, uh, without whom this uh, event series wouldn't be possible. So um, Alison is linked to Juniper and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with her. Um, so following my little short bit, and I'll just do a quick bit of um, Zoom housekeeping um, in a second. Uh, we'll have a few words from Professor Julia Gogg, who's going to say um, something about uh, Juniper and then following um, this will have Alison, who's going to sort of set the scene and give a bit of background. And um, then we've got Liz Fearon, who's going to be chairing the first session. And before I forget, I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of this, but we do have another Juniper Ramp linked event on the 27th of April, which is on controlling COVID-19 in schools. And um, that will be a hybrid event. Um, so it will be virtual, but it will be physical for those who can get to uh, Cambridge, um, and I'm sure it will be relevant to a number of you here today. So a quick bit of Zoom housekeeping. So at the end of each talk, uh, you've got you've got your programmes, you were emailed the details, you can see the programme online. So at the end of each talk, there'll be a few minutes for questions. So you can either post your questions in chat or raise your hand. Um, so we are in Zoom meetings, um, which is a bit more collaborative um, for, that, for that purpose. Um, and at the end of the day, you'll see that there is a half hour discussion um, and, and Q&A session, and that is going to be chaired by uh, Julia Hogg and Alison Hale. And we're hoping that um, some of our speakers um, can also attend that session at the end. Um, I'll sort of remind um, if, uh, all our speakers, the ones that aren't here at the moment, even if it just means, you know, that, that they come back later in the day, if they're busy. Um, if you can please stay muted throughout, but of course raise your hand if you wish to speak or ask a, ask a question at the end of each talk and just to say this session is being recorded but only speakers and organizers um, uh, are seen um, and i think the q a sessions will be recorded but they won't be posted on that's just for gathering information um, later today uh, sometime in the afternoon we'll remind you but we will post a feedback a virtual feedback link really important to get your feedback um, they're very quick and easy to do and we'll send a follow up email to you next week with uh, the link again and also the link through to the program uh, where you can download the presentations and the talks where we've had speakers permission. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Professor Julia Gold. Jane, thank you very much and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here mainly in my Juniper hat. So Juniper, you may have heard of, is a consortium uh, we started with 16 senior investigators across eight universities with uh, many other researchers and I co-lead it together with Matt Keeling from Warwick and Dr Kira Dangerfield is our programme manager. Juniper has been really heavily involved in uh, the mathematical modelling of COVID-19 and has been very busy indeed contributing to UK government advice uh, via SPIM and SAID and its subgroups over the last two years. Juniper has also been a route for us to engage with the wider research community. And we've had this very successful partnership uh, with RAMP and the Newton Institute, and particularly these meetings through the Newton Gateway, such as this meeting. Um, I'm really excited to focus on this topic for today, and it's a really outstanding speaker lineup, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, in any disaster of any kind, inequalities are exacerbated but with an infectious disease process this is really it all happens at another level with the dynamics and the feedbacks and it's not just the transmission process but i think we're going to hear a lot more today about the dynamics of testing 
isolation and uh, reporting and being able to monitor the, the epidemic at all. And all of these factors are completely woven through with socioeconomic determinants, making a really big complex system. This question of socioeconomic factors has been a thread running throughout this pandemic. And there's been really major policy implications for the UK, uh, which are tied into this. And yet two years in, and it feels like it's an area which is really, really poorly understood. And there are really many open questions and there are hard problems here which really matter. And to get at them, we're going to have to work together across many disciplines. I'm really delighted that Alison is leading and organising this workshop. Uh, she's a member of Juniper, who we're very, very proud of. Um, Alison has been working in this area for a while and has contributed, uh, particularly through SPIM and its regional variation subgroup, um, as is also Anthony Wood, who's one of the speakers today. I'm also really pleased to hear to see um, participants here from the SAGE Enduring Prevalence subgroup. And uh, we've also seen some of um, Kaveh Jahansani's uh, work, who we're going to hear from later as well. So I'm excited that all this is going to come together, multiple disciplines, so we can think about these hard problems. Uh, without waffling any more, I think I'm going to hand over to Alison to uh, kick us off. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, Julia. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. And firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Jane Leakes and her team for managing this event. And also thank you to the Juniper Consortium for supporting my research over the last year and also giving me the opportunity to organise this event. Today's workshop, as Julia has alluded to, in many ways is a spin-off um, of my work in the regional variation group, which um, Julia was um, chairing. So the remit of this biome group was really population spread of COVID in physical space. But last autumn, it occurred to me, I wonder what would happen if we looked in an abstract space as opposed to a physical space. And in particular, I was thinking of an age deprivation space. In doing this, I hope I didn't disrupt Julia's group. Well, at least not too much. So to set the scene for today's workshop, I'm going to give give a, a really quick overview um, of a few observations. No statistical models here, this is just plain observations. And I'm going to make no apology at this point for raising more questions than I, than I can possibly hope to answer. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen now. At least I hope I was going to share my screen. Brilliant. So I'm going to show you, first of all, get the technology working, which seems to be working. Right. So I'm going to show you three figures which, are, as I said, just observational data. And the first one is, um, well, I'll, I'll, maybe I should explain it to background first. So the data I'm using is UK HSA data for England. That data is split into two pillars, what we prefer to as pillars for anyone who's not familiar with that. Pillar one relates predominantly to the healthcare sector. So this is, say, for example, hospitals, care homes. But in this particular, in pillar one, People do not have the choice to test. It's part of the rules that has to be done. If you go into hospital for a procedure, you have to have a test. No, no way of opting out. On the other hand, in a moment, I'm going to show you some pillar two results. The pillar two results relate to community testing. So this is the sort of testing you would have done at home, for example, with an LFT, or maybe if you were unfortunate enough to have COVID symptoms, you may have gone to a national test center to have a PCR test. In this case, individuals are choosing to have the test. So those aren't to keep that sort of in your mind of the not choosing and the choosing, I think here is probably quite an important factor. So I'm going to refer using here, I'm going to use IMD. IMD stands for index of multiple index of multiple deprivation. And it's a general measure that the Office of National Statistics use for quantifying deprivation, obviously. I'm going to consider this in terms of um, deciles. So when I show this time series in a moment, it will be colored with the, according to the key on the right hand side there. 
So DES 101 relates to the um, most deprived or the most disadvantaged 10% of the population, and each decile represents 10% of the population. Um, and this goes sequentially through to um, the 10th decile, which relates to the most privileged, should we say, part of the population. So the time series is nothing more than the count of um, positive test cases. So let me just um, uncover that a bit. So going all the way through from last April, through the various wild type alpha, delta, omega waves, we can see this graph. Now the thing to focus on here, perhaps, is just what the dark blue line and the um, light blue line is doing. Dark blue line relates to the most deprived and the least uh, blue line, the least deprived. Bearing in mind this is for the healthcare sector predominantly, it's not really particularly surprising to see that most of the time the more deprived members of the population are turning up in pillar one um, and the least deprived not so much. Amongst any other things, we, we know that the most deprived and most disadvantaged tend to have more comorbidities. The health tends to be less good on average. So now let's compare this with pillar two. Now remember this is when people can choose to test. So if we look at the first part of the time series of pillar two, and we would have seen these pictures or the general shape of these pictures many times, throughout the pandemic. This happens to be on a log scale just for convenience. And again, up until the last six months, which is where this stops currently, on the whole, the most deprived deciles are reporting the most cases. And this is true sort of sequentially. If we look around about, if you can see my mouse, I don't know if you can find it, if you can see my mouse, around about here in sort of May, 2021, it's sort of, the order of these lines is pretty much the same order as they are in the figure. The most deprived reporting the most cases, the least deprived reporting the least cases. However, in the last six months, things became a little bit different. Around about last summer and leading into last autumn, we started to see patterns of the least deprived reporting the most cases. So there's been this inversion, and it is a complete inversion. The order of these lines in many places, maybe just look at the end here, just the most recent time, which was a week ago, is in exactly the opposite order now. So what's going on? Why has that happened? Let's just delve a little bit deeper for a moment. So here is a panel plot and um, got age, on the vertical axis, IMD on the horizontal axis, deprivation, most deprived, I'll just remind you is one, the least deprived is 10. And it's colored according to who was reporting the most positive cases. So the brighter the pixel, the more positive cases are being reported. And the other thing to say about this is that on all of these plots that look like this, I'm going to show you um, all of the 120 pixels in the panel are normalized by population. So they're normalized by the population in their particular age IMD group, just so that we can compare across scales. Um, and in this particular panel, I'm showing you 04 2020 stands for April 2020. And we can see here that um, those reporting the most cases are. In this sort of 40 to 60 age range, um, and also we see quite a lot of activity in the over 90s. So now let's look at the first six months of the pandemic and see how this sort of was evolving. We can see that the over 90s are, are being hit quite hard, and in younger age group, it tends to be the lower deciles who seem to be most reporting the most cases. So let's now go forward a bit further into the first year of the pandemic. And um, you can see now that as we start to go through, because by the time we got to December 2020, we're just starting the vaccination programme. 
And the further we go through, the epidemic is starting to get pushed, squashed perhaps into the lower age groups. Um, but still, it's on the whole, it's the lowest deciles which are reporting the most cases. To carry on to the next six months, so into last year now, and the pandemic is pretty much getting squashed into this lowest age group. By about um, July, we were coming out of lockdown, and the 17 to 21 year olds seem to have sort of be creating quite a stripe along here. Maybe they just got fed up with being locked down. But there's something else about that group. It's now the most privileged who are reporting the most cases. Obviously, we went back into the school term and the university terms. Now, with so many people being vaccinated you know, by October, November last year, the pandemic was really being pretty much squashed into that lower school age group. However, if you look at November, for example, you can see here just a light area relating to the parents being infected. But again, it's these higher deciles which are reporting the most cases. And that remains the case to this, this current time. Although at this current time, the age group, sorry, not the age group, at this current time, the, um, there's now quite a spread across age groups as far as Omicron is concerned. So one thing that we, you, you might immediately say to me is, well, Alison, why didn't you plot the positivity? Why have you only plotted the positive cases? Well, the simple answer to that, I don't have any negative, um, well, I do have de negative test data, but I don't have any IMD information in that. You might also ask, um, well, were the differences between lateral flow tests and PCRs if we plotted them in this way? And the answer to that would be yes. In general, lateral flow tests tended to have um, more deprived people reporting in that group. PCRs tended to have be more biased towards people who were more privileged. You could also ask me, well, what were the differences if you looked at reinfections? Well, I must admit, I haven't looked at reinfections for a couple of months, but the last time I did, and not really surprisingly, um, at that point, um, tended to be the more deprived who were reporting the most cases in terms of reinfections. But then the most deprived do tend to have poorer health, so perhaps not surprising. So as the day goes on, I'm hoping that um, Tristan and Anthony and Kevin and John will maybe reveal a bit more about this. They've done some really nice analysis between them all. So what might we consider is going on here? What things might we want to think about? Well, we might want to think about depletion of susceptibles. So the vaccination program, for example, clearly will have depleted susceptibles in the older age groups, as we've just seen. But so would natural immunity. So who in society was building up natural immunity and when? So we, we know that in the early days of the pandemic, um, the white collar workers, if I can put it like that, were working from home, people like myself. So I wasn't really coming into contact with um, very many people during that period. Yet there were other people, many of whom were in lower paid jobs, who had a lot of contacts. And the most obvious example of that is healthcare workers. So could it be that some of this switching in IMD behaviour that we're seeing is due to depletion of susceptibles in the lower INDs? Maybe, um, perhaps early on they got more infections and later on, those of us who were working at home went out again, increased our contacts and then became more susceptible as a result. Another fact we might consider is motivation for testing or not testing. For example, can everybody afford to take time off work? Um, perhaps people might be more motivated to test over Christmas to protect elderly and vulnerable relatives. Then we might consider how about compliance with rules? How does this vary across deciles? Has compliance varied across time throughout the pandemic? Yeah. Are the most dis disadvantaged in our society so dis dis disenfranchised that they take less notice of rules, any rules, um, and therefore perhaps we're not doing what we may have hoped? This is not an exhaustive list, and nor is it meant to be. And I'm sure that you can think of many other things. And I'm sure that Claire Bramber later this afternoon we'll have um, some things to say about all of this.
So for those of you like me, um, who love doing mathematical modeling, and the purpose of this is just to fill the screen rather than to um, talk about this, this just happens to be a prediction of the reproduction number for the 2nd of September last year. I'm not going to give any more details about that. So once we've decided what we want our models to do, what questions we want to answer, what my feeling is in this pandemic, we've had a bit of a problem because do we really understand the complexities of the data, the complexities of behavior here, the complexities of the testing behaviors, the biases in our data sets, the complexities of the temporal dynamics, and I leave these as open questions that perhaps we may be able to unpick it a bit as the day goes on. But even once we've done our models, then what? Well, presumably, if our models are going to be more than for academic interest, you know, we would like to know what the policy makers' perspective is on all of this. How can we, as scientists, best feed into policy decisions, particularly in the future? So I'm hoping that maybe and um, Brendan Collins and certainly Dr. Bugucci later this afternoon will um, maybe feed into this aspect of the discussion. So I hope this workshop starts a conversation and perhaps answers some questions, but I have absolutely no doubt that it's going to raise more questions, probably more questions that we're going to answer today, but maybe it can be a start of a conversation. So at this point, um, I'm going to hand over to Liz Ferrum, she's Assistant Professor of Epidemiology from the London School of um, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and she's kindly agreed to chair this morning's session. So thank you very much, Liz, and I now hand over to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Alison. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and I'm excited to hear about 